Boy, yeah, I could talk uh, Quentin Tarantino movies endlessly. So let's talk Tarantino. <laughs> Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I am Chris Gore. I have a very special guest today, Tara Wood, the director of QT8, which is a documentary about the first eight Quentin Tarantino movies. Tara, welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. How are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for having me. Uh, well, thanks. We, we've actually, uh, first of all, we've hung out before at the Mammoth Film Festival, but also you did a previous episode of the Film Threat podcast. We did a kind of a deep dive when we were audio only. Um, this movie, though, is is uh, it's an evergreen. We were just talking about it. It's an evergreen. If you're a fan of Tarantino, it's a movie. And if you've maybe just discovered Tarantino, which I, I feel like a lot of people maybe just did with Once Upon a Time in, in Hollywood, um, you know, filmmakers are constantly being discovered. And one of the first things that I like to do when I discover a new filmmaker is go through the back catalog. This is what you do. You really take it from a fan's perspective. So what led to this project and kind of gaining the trust of everyone in Quentin's circle? So, um, you know, you just brought something interesting up though. Like I would love to speak to more new Tarantino fans, you know, cause I when doing the documentary. I, um, obviously revisited from Reservoir Dogs to Hateful Eight, but they've all been there, they've hung out, and I talked to those fans um, that have been around for a long time, but not to the new ones. I, I, I would love to revisit that. But to your question, um, getting the trust of Quentin was based on, my dog is kicking pillows around, sorry about that. Um, I had done a documentary on Richard Linklater and Rick and uh, Quentin were very good friends in Austin, Texas. Uh, so I, I, I was kind of running in that group and then finished Link Later and moved over to Tarantino. And I convinced him, didn't take much convincing to be honest. I sent him the Link Later documentary and he loved it. Um, and he loved that I didn't interview Rick. Um, and he said, you know, I, I don't really like to talk about myself, which I thought was fascinating. Um, so we, um, yeah, so we quickly got his approval. He said he did not want to meet me until the end, but he would support everybody in showing up. It's interesting because I, I I like this I like this idea of you didn't talk to Quentin. Like, how does an how does an artist at at um, a level of Quentin and other filmmakers you could talk about like how do they analyze their own process? I find that actually a lot of times they're not very good at it. They can talk about like. I use a yellow legal pad and pencil, or they can talk about process, but in terms of analysis, um, I, I, I don't know, like I, it's a very interesting approach that you took. So, so how did you line up? Like, like once you had like, like, cause there's a lot of people in this movie, like, oh my God, you've got, um, I mean, Tim Roth, Michael Madsen, and uh, tell me about the, everybody that's in the film. Oh, sorry. Who, who else? Okay, so Samuel Jackson, Jamie Foxx, Tim Roth, Michael Madsen, Lucy Liu, uh, his longtime producers, uh, Richard Gladstein and Stacey Scher. Um, I'm forgetting people, which is really sad. I need my poster. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people. Um, uh, oh, of course, Zoe Bell. Um, yeah, so it, it, there was quite a Sam there. Jackson. Don't forget Sam Jackson. Did I leave him out? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's okay. um, so you mentioned earlier that it's evergreen and we finished this. It's now it's on VOD right now still. Right. And we're letting it continue to live there because of that. Mm -hmm. um, it keeps just performing in that way. It's finding its audience slowly, but surely, I guess you could say. Um, but it's a, uh, yeah, it's really nice. And, and every time somebody talks about Quentin, it, it falls back to that again. So. Well, I do, I do love that in the documentary that you address things I never knew about Quentin, like about his childhood and his upbringing and, and um, how that influenced um, the movies that he saw. Like he got to see a lot of crazy movies in the theater that maybe you wouldn't have brought a kid. Um, right. and, that, and I think that spoke more to his process than anything else, his references. Like he, that he's very clear about with regard to process. 
he yeah he 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 definitely um i mean he's spoken about that before i've just never heard in this kind of detail like all of yeah. that about his childhood and how like those movie influences you always hear about the video store but i never really knew about you know all, the fact that he had like his stepdad at the time um basically taking him to to the movies who was african american so they went right. to like flotation films right Right. Exactly. So I feel like that, I feel like that gave him an insight that a lot of other people probably would not have. Right. Yeah. He considered, you know, that's part of him. So that's natural to him. And it, and it comes out in his filmmaking, obviously. And he speaks to it. I mean, he's very brave in the way he speaks to it. Well, yes. Yeah. I mean, he definitely, um, it's one of those things where I, I'm, I'm trying to think of a Quentin Tarantino movie that doesn't have a shock moment. I feel like they all do, yeah. right? They, whether it's whether it's the language and uh, or the situations or an act of violence. And speaking of violence, it's something that Quentin, I remember early in his career, he was criticized or uh, about the violence and the level of violence. Um, I feel like it's something now we come to expect in, in his films, but he even defends violence and says, you know, violence in movies is is fun. And fake. Like it's <laughs> right, fake. right. Right, right. Yeah. Like he's getting attacked for... Um, bringing violence into real life. And he was very adamant many times. And that's absolutely not true. You know, you're watching a movie um, and he uses it to, you know, to, to ampl amplify a moment, but he's usually putting a magnifying glass on something. Um, so th the violence for me watching it, I never considered, <laughs> this is weird. I didn't consider him a violent director. I didn't find his films violent because his messages were so clear to me. Also, the the, the other thing um, that's always struck me about Tarantino, and I don't know why he gets targeted. Maybe it's just because his films are popular. Um, I don't know that you could say that his movies are blockbusters. I maybe blockbusters for the level that they're made in terms of being indie, but um, his treatment of women in his films, right? Um, uh, uh, they're they're always critical characters. Uh, you know, they're not sidelined. I mean, look at Kill Bill, right? I mean, that that film alone, I mean, I, I feel like now it's sort of like, you know, we're going to have a strong female character. It's like, okay, yeah, that's that's something that studios like to give lip service to. But right. he was doing this before it was before it was a thing. So um, Again, I think that's just, you know, it's who he is. He was raised by a single mom and he was raised in um, various parts of Southeast LA, right? So he mm -hmm. was he was in the mix. It was it was mixed people and mixed cultures and mixed everything, and and that's who he is. And and he and he brings it out. Um, him separating women out of that and saying, "Oh, I'm going to write this strong character." I, I don't believe that's what he does. I, I believe that he just has strong women in his life, and he amplifies that and loves them, and they do different things. A lot of it overlaps, but with regard to their characteristics, like, you know, men tend to be more violent. So like a Kill Bill character, you don't see many women doing that, but mm -hmm. mothers do. Yeah, right? Yes. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of where that comes from is like the revenge of a mother and like Kill Bill or, or their backstory is always very detailed. Lucy Liu's character in Kill Bill, that whole thing about her childhood and the animated sequence, mm -hmm. it's, it's fantastic. So, so um, you spent you spent a long time collecting all of these interviews. What's your process, which I assume is perhaps similar to the to the Richard Linklater documentary? Um, I co-directed on that one, so I t the Tarantino documentary was very much um, it went more into my style. I guess would be very much to just be present with sitting down with, allow them to to open up in the directions that they they want to. Um, it was it was very easy in that they all have a lot to say about Quentin. They love Quentin for all the reasons we do. Um, it, with the ad, added bonus of knowing him personally and realizing like where all of this comes from. Um, so for them to slowly open up, um, it, it was fascinating. So after the first couple of interviews, you know, you gain a little bit of knowledge in places that the general public doesn't know, and then you can kind of gear that into um, the, the next interview and, and pull little nuggets out of it. Where did the 
QT8 in terms of the title for your for your documentary? Where did that where did that come from? <laughs> Quentin loves it, which I think is so cool. <laughs> it was originally the 21 years series. You know, the, the mm -hmm. director, my my idea with it was you, you have to be at least 21 from your first release, you know, so that there's a style. You, you kind of know who this director is after that many years of however many films that they do in that amount of time. Um, but QT8, it just, I don't know, it, it just worked. And I, and I had changed the name midway through to QT8. And I remember Quentin, when I finally did meet him, he's like, oh, I love the title. <laughs> See, I, I love the title because it's also, you can just remember it, you know? Yeah, it's I know like, yeah. yeah, I know there's a subhead to the title and I'm sorry I'm spacing uh, spacing on it right now, but I'm just-, just The first date, the first date? Sorry. Exactly, the first date, yeah. That would be obvious. Why would I not know? Now, are you gonna update the documentary? Um, you know, knowing I, that you- Yes, I mean- <laughs> Oh, so I, that's true, okay. Well, that's, I want that to be true. <laughs> so, um, I ho I think Quentin will let me do this and I'm hoping that he'll be a part of it so that we get the last two. Um, but I, who knows how long he's gonna take to do his 10th. It could, it could be tomorrow and it could be, you know, when his kid turns 10. Oh, God. See, yeah, I, I, I mean, I love the idea of Quentin Tarantino making 10 movies and that's it. That's just, I'm, I'm done. Um, do you, do you think that he's going to do that? And do you have any insight into what the 10th film will be? No, there's speculation. <laughs> I know I keep, so there's people that I still, you know, talk to and try to pull that out of if anybody has some insight, but he flirts with a lot of different ideas. Uh, maybe he doesn't know yet. Hmm. Yeah. Well, his life has changed. I mean, he's married. He, uh, he's a father now. I, I, um, I, that, that can change people in a good way. And um, in some instances, I can think, think of some filmmakers that kind of softened after they had kids, which is a little disappointing. Um, yeah. I'm not going to name names, George Lucas, <laughs> but I think that like, I, I you know, I, I don't know. I just want to see like, well, how is he? Cause the one thing about Tarantino is it's always like surprise, shock, twist, you know, you thought this thing was going this way. It goes completely the opposite direction and it, and it flips it. And that's always why I've loved his work is it's just completely unpredictable, especially in a business where entertainment business, everything is predictable. Everything is checking the boxes. I mean, there's so much talk these days about um, inclusion and diversity in movies. And I would argue that that was Quentin. It may not have been and been an agenda in his mind. He wasn't trying to do it, but he, that's just sort of part of him yep. that just e existed. A, a diverse cast is something that he just, it's that's why would he make a movie any other way? Right. right. He has a lot of things to say on a lot of topics. So I think that um, I, I just think that he's uh, was very forward thinking as a filmmaker. When you look back from reservoir dogs to now, I think he's an, an, a very evolved human to begin with. So he, yeah. he started from a, and his, and his, um, he started from a very evolved place. Let me finish that sentence. Mm -hmm. But then his, his trap of a mind, the way he remembers everything. Um, I think I told you this, you know, when I find, again, when I finally did sit, sit down with him, he quoted lines from the, doc, from the Linklater documentary. Mm -hmm. Oh, you is, got my text. You got my text. <laughs> Can you mute text? I don't know. I don't, you know, whatever. We're all kind of like, I mean, look, with everything that's going on now, I mean, I'm glad we're doing, we're, I'm able to talk to you and all this over this thing, yeah. but this yeah. is all, you know, we're on, a, we're on a level playing field with like, you know, the Jimmy Fallon show, right? Like this is all, we have the same production value, maybe even better actually, you know, with fancy graphics and whatnot. But like, um, you know, I, I I don't know. I feel like now audiences have just come to accept it, right? You know, well, that's about content, which is a very interesting thing to talk about. Yeah, yeah. I would love to see. Hope it is, right? <laughs> I would love to see what Quentin would do with a with a screen based film. You know, um, oh, um, I think that would be interesting. Would not like this very much. I think he would hate it. Well, I, I I there was a quote I read from him where he talked about what's his favorite period of time to set a film in, and he said any time before cell phones. He oh, really right, right. does not. And I, I, today's screenwriters really do have new challenges with like, Hey, this can solve all problems. 
any problem. I'll just look it up. I'll get, you know what I mean? Like right. you have to, you have to, you have to always write a lot. There also be some kind of line about cell service or a phone because so many problems in, in traditional storytelling can be solved with a phone now. So I'd like to see what Quentin, see, I'd like to see that would be a challenge I would throw down is like have Quentin make a movie set in the future. I mean, there were rumors of a Star Trek movie. I think that's BS. I think they're way too conservative with that brand. I don't think they would allow it in the hands of a Tarantino. Well, he but... described it as Pulp Fiction in space. Like, I can't imagine them being... <laughs> I think it would be awesome because I really think the truth, it, yeah. the truth and reality of space travel, I would love to see Tarantino take an approach that would be something like uh, 2001 a space odyssey but tarantino style and just show the mundane show the like you know i i, I the psychological toll that it would take on people yeah. and um of course there would be violence but yeah i'd love to see tarantino do a science fiction movie i mean um i, I think that would be yeah. awesome or a superhero film something something genre i think kill bill is kind of the closest thing to that yeah. Uh, but just, I, I feel like there are so many cliches and sort of boxes that need to be ticked. And I'd love to see a filmmaker with his kind of power break well, out. And space so. would eliminate the cell phone issue. That's true. It would. No, there's no cell phones in space. Maybe. I guess there are communicators, but they right. could be broken. Um, right. I know you're working on another documentary that's kind of an offshoot of QT8. Is it too early to talk about it? I know we talked about it at that film festival. Yeah, um, I can mention that it's happening. Okay. So, so what's happening? The, <laughs> what's happening? I already know. I don't know which one you're talking about because there's two. Oh, there's two. Okay. Can I say that one of the people is in QT8? Okay. Yeah. 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 So let's go that, that way. Okay. So, yeah. So the Michael Madsen documentary is in the works. Okay. That's uh, cool because he told an amazing story while we were at that film festival about him going to Quentin's house and they watched this movie. What was it? Was it, was it the stuff or something? They watched some like cheesy exploitation movie and, and, and he sort of messed with his kids and it, which, which was amazing. <laughs> so, and Madsen just told some really off the cuff stories and I'm thinking like, okay, this was like a one hour panel, right? Like I'd love to see the stories he could tell uh, just, just, you know, spanning his whole career. He's got great stories. The so the documentary will there's there's definitely new stories there. Um, have you seen the Michael Matson video, the home video that just went out? Oh yeah, yeah. Where he re yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So he, that he, he's doing some press on that, and I've heard mm -hmm. stories that even I haven't heard from the Tarantino doc to the Matson doc. I'm like, how many stories do you have? So I don't know if we actually get them all out there's obviously a lot well it's it's either it's either a movie or a podcast but i'm going to say movie will be you know distill the best talk to michael michael would love to sit down and talk to you okay all right good let's get him on the, let's, get, let's get michael madsen on the film threat podcast i want to i want to hear him threaten me over a live stream and see how that see how that goes um <laughs> but but the interesting the other interesting thing about QT8 we talked a lot about this I'll put a link in the description on YouTube for people who you know to to listen to the uh, previous episode because we really we really I think we like ran out of time yeah um, on, on that one but um, okay. you also uh, this will be of interest to indie indie filmmakers listening you self distributed QT8. In in a, I mean self distributed, but with some partners, right? With some help. So, yeah, tricky word self distribute because I've been doing this for twenty years, right? Right, right. I partnered with um, Shaked Berenson, the Entertainment Squad, um, who's formerly of Epic Pictures. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, so we got together and and we put this out together. Um, the landscape is really different. Like I, I self distribute means I'm going to go put it on Prime. I don't really recommend that to indie filmmakers. I think mm -hmm. find, we, and we had this conversation like with, with distributors and who you choose to work with, mm -hmm. look at that as, as like a marriage. It's like that important. And trust becomes very important. The film's gonna do what the film's gonna do to a certain extent. You know, obviously different people, uh, you know, Sony would do a different job than I would, right? But 
ultimately the money that funnels back, if you're dealing with Sony, what do you see? I shouldn't use specific words. When you're dealing with bigger companies, um, now you have to, when it goes really wide, when a film goes really wide, there's a lot of money to make that happen. So do you want to spend all that money or do you want to kind of do it a different way and do your own kind of marketing and, and push it the way you know the film should go? So there's a lot of different choices to make with regard to that. Sometimes a deal with a big studio is great. A lot of times it is. A lot of times it isn't. Um, but the, the indie way to go now, what we did with QTA, is much more viable than it used to be. First, can I say I'm still getting used to using all this streaming stuff. I think a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, we're all kind of like reinventing like how we do things, and um, it's 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 really cool that we can continue to do all these things. So, so I apologize, I apologize for any. Sometimes you disappear though, and then like on the screen, it's just my big fat face. So. Uh, well, it's I, <laughs> yes, I, less of me is what I prefer. No, um, I see you. <laughs> it's fine, but um, but uh, so. But what's in here's what's interesting that you did, which I think was awesome. One, you know, I, I really feel like you indie filmmakers need to protect their investment in their film like you would a stock, right? Anything you can do that, to increase the value of the stock, it's who's in it, it's who your partners are and whatnot. I mean, just toward actually making a living as a filmmaker, right? So you make the film, then you got to like a whole you know, you've, you've got to put it out. Obviously there are many pathways to putting a film out on, on VO, VOD, which includes iTunes and Vudu and, and all these other outlets, but you did something pretty amazing, which I think is cool is you partnered with Fathom events and you did one of those like one day only, yeah. one day only screening. You show that you did it. Like it was like the week that it came out on VOD or just before I thought it was so smart. And can, can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, so that's a great option. So Fathom um, offers that one night event theatrical showing. Right. So um, I really wanted to go a lot bigger and get like a whole, you know, Tarantino esque event, you know, mm -hmm. and broadcast from there and then it goes out to all the theaters. Um, we were a little bit pressed for time and ended up doing so you could do a live event at, at a location and it'll go to all the locations, or you could do a pre recorded thing. So we did gotcha. the pre recorded intro. For ours, right. which is great as well, just a different way to do it. So yeah, so Fathom, um, it, they're a great company and it's a great concept. And it's um, with regard to what that event is, obviously it's different every time based on your film mm -hmm. and lighting. Um, and you can definitely gear it to your audience. Um, so, and then what that does is lifts and supports that VOD platform and the other windows. Well, Fathom Events is a, a company, I think they're in, are they in, Colorado, Colorado. Yeah. 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 So, um, I, I, I don't know. I kind of feel like it's a new option for indie filmmakers, but what I, what I actually think is an amazing opportunity right now for indie filmmakers is in the midst of everything that's happening, playing field is leveled, you know, production value of film threat is the same as, like I said, the late night shows, yeah. you know, um, there with no films coming to theaters, this is an opportunity for movies on VOD to thrive and survive. I feel like you can only take so much of like, I mean, I, I, I feel like you could do a show. Like I spend as much time kind of looking for something to watch on Netflix as I watch on Netflix. Sometimes <laughs> um, it gets a little, it gets a little draining. Yeah. But um, I, I think that that's where the VOD thing comes into play. The studios took advantage of that, you know, recently with, trolls world tour you know being released you know it was supposed to come to theaters they're just like we're gonna do video on demand we're just doing it that's it do Sorry. you know numbers on that i yeah. do, see here's the thing that's actually disconcerting there are no numbers i mean while the box office would be reported i even don't 100 trust box office numbers anyways oh. um just as someone who's for i've four walled a movie before um i released a film uh, self-released my big fat independent movie. And when you four wall a theater, as you know, like, like you get all the money that comes to the box office. So I just bought all the tickets. I bought all the tickets for the first two shows and then it technically sold out. And then I just gave the tickets to friends and then I got the money back. So I don't know, but, but yeah, VOD, there needs to be some independent organization to 
look at those numbers, whether it's reported um, as revenue, whether it's reported as, but, but I don't know. I think studios keep that stuff close to the, close to the vest. They do. See, the thing is, is VOD, you can't fudge those numbers. So I think that's why they're not sharing them. Well, I mean, they're, they're different platforms. So did it sell on iTunes or this or movies anywhere or all these different or right, you know, but, all these different ways to buy it? With, with, I think with the cinema, like what you were kind of alluding to with theatrical numbers or box office mm -hmm. numbers, are those real numbers? Right, right. right? So yeah. with VOD, it, where are you going to – if there's a reporting agency, I don't know where that – the chasm will be. Well, I, I think I think that this is something that the trades have to jump on right now. Is that they've really yeah. got to, they've really got to find a way to, um, to to report this because it's important to the industry to see where people succeeded and failed. I mean, the way you learn lessons, I think, as an industry, is really looking at um, this movie did well, this movie tanked, why right? Dissecting that. That's, that's at least for the larger world, you know, for, for indie film, I think indie filmmakers are constantly trying to reinvent the wheel toward, toward profitability, right? We're just constantly trying to, to reinvent that wheel. So it's a little frustrating at times. And what I'm saying is I think you kind of, kind of invented like a new way of like this, and then it's, it's fathom event supports it and you do that timing. And then, and then your film is, is, is an evergreen in that sense, right? I think a lot of pop culture documentaries um, are like that. Like I, I, I look at like um, a marijuana documentary from 20 years ago mm -hmm. is not really valid now because so much has changed in terms of society, right? right. But um, those Quentin Tarantino films are always going to be preserved. They're just going to be there, right? For people to discover. That's why I, I kept it, it's very straightforward. In the mm -hmm. sense that it, it, you know, I don't dig into his personal life. There's not like these salacious stories that are, are damaging to anybody. They're just real cool stories that magnify his style and way of doing things. So it, it exists there and, and will stay there. there there's nothing that's going to, there's no, you know, gotchas in there that's going to change this having relevance. So well, that, I, that was very important to me. First of all, I'm glad you did that because I personally don't care. Like, you know, um, unless someone's going to jail, unless someone's going to jail, I just don't care. And even that, I, I don't know. I just, those kind of things are like, um, it's, I, I don't know. I just, the, the personal lives of celebrities, I feel like, but we live in a, in an age now where just everything is out in the open living in public, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of uh, strange times, but I've never cared about that stuff. Uh, and they're people, you know. they're actual people. <laughs> yeah that deserve some respect and privacy. And it's, it's unfortunate that their, their lives are dissected in the public way they are sometimes. I've, on, I've only ever cared about the work or maybe how someone's experience, life experience affects the work. Uh, for example, George Lucas getting in um, potentially a catastrophic, he almost died in a car accident when he was like uh, in, in high school. And, and that had a profound effect on George Lucas. So, I mean, um, those kinds of experiences, I mean, uh, Tarantino's upbringing from a oh, single right. mom. Exactly. exactly. So that, that, like, that matters. That matters. Uh, like, I, I, I don't know, like uh, other things are uh, celebrities, personal lives. I kind of feel like uh, it just, it's never interested me. It's, it's uh, just, I don't know, just, yeah. I don't care. Well, even with the bringing in the Weinstein conversation into QT8. Right, right. Like that was really hard to do, especially, <laughs> I have to say, being personally offended by everything that went on. Right. right. So trying to hold that back as a as a woman. And you, I kind of sort of had a platform, right? I could have gone very sideways with that. And, yeah. And I was very careful to be like, Here, here's what happened here's what Quentin did. Here's what the, you know, and y you can decide how you feel about that. It was, right. it was very much left unopinionated. It's hard to do. That's as hard to do as just, you know, I keep turning off my message and I, <laughs> that's okay. I, I, I'm popular. <laughs> hey, it's challenging. It's challenging. 
Um, mm -hmm. But um, I guess like, sticking to the tr to true stories and um, it just being kind to people, you still get great stories. You still get great cinema. You don't you don't have to be salacious. <laughs> I, I I agree. Um, Tara would thank you so much for uh, being on the Film Threat podcast. Um, your next film, the Michael Madsen film. I know you're going to be back to talk about that. I actually want to have you on another uh, episode where we can just only talk about indie film distribution and kind of the the evolution of that and then current methods and, and pathways for filmmakers. So uh, please, this is just a reminder to subscribe to the Film Threat Podcast, whether you're listening on Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, or whether you're watching us on YouTube, share it. Um, write something in the comments. We will, we will, I'll comment back. And um, if you want to support what we're doing, uh, please go to soundcloud.com slash film threat. You can listen to episodes, including the QT8 episode, the Terra's on the previous episode where we went off the rails many times. Um, <laughs> and, and you can support our work there, but more than anything, I just thank you for, uh, thank you for listening or watching and uh, subscribe and, and, and thank you. Thank you, Tara. Appreciate it. Thank you. Cool.